I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Hey, The 300th episode of my podcast is coming up. I cannot believe I've done 300. I'm so excited. I really wanted to do something fun and get you guys involved. Here's what I came up with. Someone listening right now, it might be you, will win a chance to come to New York City for a live podcast taping. To learn more, just go to jamesaltucher.com slash podcast. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. So we're here to discuss your book, My Adventures with God, which when I read it, I literally said, who the hell is this guy? (laughs) Like, my conclusion when I read it was, there's only two ways someone can write this book, is if they were incredibly broken as a human being (laughs) somewhere in their lives. And then they kind of climbed out of that hole by thinking all of these intense and philosophical thoughts, or you were just born that way. And I still haven't figured out which one. Maybe we'll figure it out on this podcast. We're all kind of writing and choosing our narratives to some extent. Mm -hmm. And again, your book is like amazing because I didn't understand (laughs) part of it. Not because it was bad, because I had to like stop and really think because these thoughts were so valuable that I really wanted to know what they meant. Well, I think on a personal level, we all end up developing these narratives. As I said, either it's instinct, sometimes it's choice, but as you said, it fits into larger narratives. I think we live in the dark so much of the time that we need metaphors to find our way. And I believe a philosophy is only useful if it helps you to see in the dark. Yeah, you say a couple things (laughs) about the dark. (laughs) I am so happy to have this next guest here. Not only is he one of the main characters and actors in one of my favorite TV shows, Silicon Valley, but he's been in 200 other movies and a thousand other things, including uh, Seinfeld, Thelma and Louise. Uh, You were Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day. You were the most annoying character in Groundhog Day every single day. And how many, that's like this iconic movie that everyone's seen at least 20 times. But Stephen Toblowski, welcome to the show. Thank you. It is good to be, it's good to be here in New York. Wait, now people won't know the name Stephen Toblowski, I have to tell you, but... Just do Jack Barker for a second from Silicon Valley. (laughs) Um, You know, guys, I I think the boys, they like to go over the North Pole (laughs) when they take this flight. So actually, Jackson Hole would be a little closer. So we just... That that 
kind of almost passive aggressive argument you had with that other guy was so funny. And then, you know, I've worked in the tech space and in the entrepreneurial space for so long. That way, when you became the CEO of the company, and maybe a lot of people haven't watched Silicon Valley, so this will just be a quick tangent because I really want to talk about other things. But the way you took over as CEO of Pied Piper and the kind of passive aggressive way, this happens so much where the main guy says, what do you guys think of doing X? And then they're all like going back and thinking about it, but you've or the CEO has already made the decision and just starts acting on that. And I've seen that happen so many times and you did it perfectly in the show where it's like so annoying, but it's already too late for anybody to do anything. It, it's, it's, did you learn that that happens all the time? or? Well, I think it happens all the time in life. I, it, it's the cloaked viciousness. Where, the where cloaked every, viciousness, what do you mean? Well, everything is un, under the guise of being polite or under the guise of giving other people their opinion is really just a cloaked viciousness that you've already made the decisions and now you're giving them the chance to feel like they are making theirs, but they really have no part in it. And, and that is... I think one of the through lines of Silicon Valley, these, what, what began as, I, I explained to Mike Judge, and if you people have not seen Silicon Valley, here is my thumbnail explanation. It is about a young man who's discovered fire. And that is Richard Hendricks. He's come up with a new way that computers work and it could change the world. But everyone now wants a piece of it. They either want to steal it or they want to use it or they want to hide it or they want to uh, somehow make it their own. And it's what Richard will do with his fire. And I think that's what's so wonderful about the show besides it being so funny. It's his invention becomes his create creative life, becomes his soul. And, and, and yeah, he has a very, he has a lot of integrity about what he wants to do. Sometimes. And, and <laughs> right, sometimes. But even when he doesn't play by the superficial rules of Silicon Valley, he's, he, his integrity about what he's discovered and his belief in it is very strong. Like he's, he's clearly a good person. It's a battle. Yeah. It's a battle as to who will win. His, his his quest for success or fame or whatever or or his invention to protect and nurture his invention and and that's kind of part of the drama of it that also makes it funny so I mean we're here to discuss your book my adventures with God which um uh when I read it I I literally said who the hell is this guy like <laughs> This book and I read a lot, and and this book is so. I there's my conclusion when I read it was there's only two ways someone can write this book is if they were incredibly broken as a human being <laughs> somewhere in their lives, and then they kind of clump, climbed out of that hole by thinking all of these intense and philosophical thoughts. Or you were just born that way, and I still haven't figured out which one. Maybe we'll figure it out <laughs> on this podcast. But I do want to just just to get Silicon Valley is this kind of like iconic show. It's on HBO. Um, it it really does emulate a lot of real life situations and characters in Silicon Valley, where where, where much of the wealth and innovation of the country is currently happening. So it's so it's an important show. It's also important in that it's. Um, uh, it's a very comedic show about a serious topic. And in fact, you have guys like Martin Starr, who started off in Judd Apatow's Freaks and Geeks. You have, um, you know, Kamal Naranji, is that? Mm -hmm. Who was a, a stand-up comic who's in the show. Richard Hendricks and TJ Miller, stand-up comics. Uh, so, so, so the roles are very much filled with comedy in mind about a very serious topic, which I think is a very... Uh, it's not a new style. Like obviously Seinfeld, which you were on, uh, had that style as well. But I, I think that style works. But you coming from a real professional actor background, I mean, you're a comedic actor, but you've been in 200 movies, you've been in all these shows. Uh, people should know you turned down the role of Al in Home Improvement. You've been in Freaky Friday. You've been in every single movie. But how did you as an actor um, feel about the rest of the cast and see the differences between comics playing roles, comedians playing roles, plus the advi the role of the advisors who were so, who were these billionaires in Silicon Valley. Um, like what was your interaction in the, in, in the, in the show? What's, what's so brilliant about the people in Silicon Valley, like Thomas Middleditch, who plays Richard Hendricks, I'll, I'll bring him up as an example. When I was doing Groundhog Day, 
Harold Ramis says, comedy exists in the two shot. You always have to have a two shot because you have to have the active ingredient of the world going askew and you have to have the world in the same shot. So in Groundhog Day, for example, I'm Ned, so I am the portrait of the world going askew. And in those scenes, Bill Murray was the world. That's right. So he was living in his consistent world. And at least when he was starting out in Groundhog Day, and by the way, I'm not even going to explain Groundhog Day. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> it'll. if you see it now, it'll be one of your 10 best movies of all time, if not your best movie of all time. I mean, whoever sees it, you'll say this is your one of your top three. But you often are the one who Bill Murray suddenly realizes, oh, the world is not what I thought. Quite possibly. And, and when you are the world as an actor, you are the Greek chorus. You're the way the audience, you become the audience. That's the way the audience is seeing the scene. So on Silicon Valley, what happens is all of these actors are so skilled but they know their role in terms of the story and they can immediately shift from being the world is a skew character to being the world. Like Thomas Middleditch does as Richard Hendricks. He, he can be the greatest leading man and, and be us in a scene, or he could be go off the rails and be Looney Tunes. T.J. Miller occasionally could do that, but but <laughs> he's usually the he's one. He's a great stand-up comic. Great stand-up comic. But that was one of the things that makes that cast so special is because everyone is a role player like on a great basketball team. Sometimes it's your time to shoot. Sometimes it's your time to play defense and pass. And everybody on that show kind of knows what their role is, and they know when to pass, when to shoot. But let me ask you, uh, uh, I mean – both skills are hard, stand-up comedy and acting. Um, what's and you you saw it very directly on Silicon Valley, and you've seen it on many of your shows, obviously, but but Silicon Valley's most recent. The stand-up comics are not actors. They're not. Maybe they have some skill and talent and ability to act, but you've been doing it forever, and you really know the skill. It's a different skill. So, what do you see as the difference between someone playing uh, uh, a character as a stand-up comic as a background? and or where you played your role where you know theater movies acting was your background well i would have a different answer on a different day but right now my answer would be a lot of times actors have a greater sense of structure of of an overall piece for example when you are a stand up comic i noticed good bad or indifferent they continually reinvent act 1 each joke is a new act 1 act 1 act 1 act 1 and if one of them doesn't work they're on to the next act 1 as an actor, you have to take a look at the entire piece you're working on and see are, what part of the story are you in. And when you're an actor, you're more skilled at an analysis, at understanding what part of the story you're in and what you have to deliver. Uh, that would be the answer I'd give you today. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure I understand completely. Like, so you're analyzing who you are within the context of the story, and then you're, you're, you're figuring out from within how much you can play that role. Whereas they get a line, they're going to deliver that line the way they might deliver it in stand-up on a stage. Uh, I'm saying that, well, you, you take a look at when in Silicon Valley, the first scene I had with T.J. Miller when he starts insulting me about how old and <laughs> decrepit I am. And in the script, there were three insults he had. And then as the scene, he we started shooting and he just kept doing insult after insult that I'm at the Metamucil age and I'd like a nice piece of fish. And he kept going on and on and on with these insults. I had no idea what we were doing. And then uh, Alec Berg, our executive uh, producer, crawled on the floor in between the two of us with an envelope with more insults and hands it up to T.J. Miller out of frame of camera and T.J.'s grabbing him, looks at them and starts with another. He ended up insulting me for five straight minutes. That would be something I would say is in the realm of stand-up comedy. And by the way, as someone who has been personally insulted by T.J. Miller, <laughs> it is a great experience and he's very funny and very quick. The fact that Alec Berg had to give him even more insults shows how much he, they were really trying to make that scene happen. Yes, and and I think they cut it down, but they cut it down mercifully for me and, and my loved ones. They cut it down to a few insults, but I think on the internet floating around is the original five-minute version of the insults. 
And after about four minutes, I couldn't not laugh, right? I couldn't not laugh. I just start laughing and I was trying to keep my shoulder from shaking because the camera shot was over my shoulder onto TJ. And at the end of the scene, I went up to TJ and just apologized. I said, I am so sorry I broke character. Now there's a difference. See, stand-up comedians don't care if you break character. Actors, you're not supposed to break character. I wasn't supposed to laugh. I was supposed to be Jack Barker and be serious. I said, TJ, I'm so sorry I broke character there. He said, are you kidding? I love that. I'm a comedian. I want to see that my jokes are landing. I love that you were laughing. I hate these actors who come in and take themselves so damn seriously that that they don't want to break character. I love that you broke character. That's wonderful. And I apologize to Mike Judge, and he says, oh, don't worry about it, Stephen. We're just going to cut you out of the scene. Because <laughs> he's been doing co- comedic <laughs> shows forever, right. uh, his Beavis and Butthead. Right. And also Alec Berg, just to just to kind of look at the lineage of this, he was um, Curb Your Enthusiasm's executive producer, and before that he was one of the um, head writers and then a beginning writer with Seinfeld. Like Larry David really rose this guy up, and you might have, I don't even, I didn't make the connection until now, but you probably knew him from your Seinfeld days. I, or I, your day, Seinfeld I probably, day. Yeah, I probably ran into him at some point, but that was the first season of Seinfeld huh. in which I played a tour. That was the first season. and uh, Yeah, he wasn't there then. I don't think so. Uh, but that's, I guess, when I met Larry and Larry Charles. I met them both doing that show. And they really rose up. They really mentored Alec Berg, who's now you know doing uh, Silicon Valley. I think he's involved with this season's Curb Your Enthusiasm. I'm not sure, but... Uh, but that's really where he gets his comic sensibility. Yeah, yeah, from, from the best in the world. Yeah, but I, I think it when and, and there's another uh, footnote I would do to your original question of comedian versus actor, and that is what is your medium? What what are you acting in when you're acting in a stage play? You are quite often involved with Aristotle's unities of you, you you have an act one of rising action you know i mean introduction rising action conclusion you have all of that that you have to bring to the audience when you're doing television you're always kind of doing act one and act two because if you get to act three the season's over i don't understand what you mean like act, act you mean of the arc of the story the arc of the story has to keep the ball has to keep up in the air and can it can only really resolve on sweeps week. And usually they end up on some shows just killing someone on sweeps week. So they have a false kind of climax, which isn't really a climax. Uh, they brought me on that TV show, Heroes, the second season. Oh yeah, you were totally evil. Yeah, if you keep saying shows that you're on, it'll suddenly like flashbacks me who you were. You were totally evil. You were like the most evil guy around on Heroes. I had no idea what I was on Heroes. <laughs> and and I don't think the producers really knew. Uh, Alan Arkosh was the executive producer and they gave me a script. Uh, I was playing uh, Bob, I, I, head, head of the corporation, the company or whatever. And I said, what, what am I on this show, Alan? And he says, well, Stephen, Imagine you're a bad guy who's really a good guy, who thinks he's a bad guy, who really wants to be a good guy, but can't help but being a bad guy. I said, okay, I get it. I get it. You guys don't know either. Okay, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just fly with that. The sweeps week, uh, they killed me. Uh, they, they decided they would kill me as a big climax. E- but, even though that might not have been the climax of the season. No, yes, because you have to keep the ball in the air. Uh-huh. It all you, you have to keep the real ball in the air. You can't answer the original question, which a play would. A play would get to a conclusion and answer the original questions in Act 1 because the audience won't be satisfied. But on television, they keep the ball in the air if they want another season. Uh, I remember... Of course, Heroes had more than they bargained for with me because they killed me, right? And Siler ate my brains, I think, because my eyes were shut and I was covered with red food coloring the whole time. (laughs) But I think he ate my brains. But I got a phone call about eight or 10 weeks later saying that they wanted to reshoot my death, that they had rewritten uh, the script and wanted to give... um, uh, my daughter on that show, an, another monologue. And what they hadn't figured is that I had a terrible accident in between the end of shooting Heroes and them wanting to reshoot my death and that I had broken my neck in five places 
uh, riding on a horse on an active volcano in Iceland. Oh, just figure yeah. like... Why did I do that? <laughs> I would never do that, by the way. Why take even 1% risk? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then do it on a volcano in Iceland at the same time. It was dopey. It was a dopey move. And, uh, and did you let him do this? <laughs> she did it with me. She was there saving me the whole time. It was, it was just, right, good. but I came back and the, the producers, I, I said, guys, uh, I have a broken neck now. And they said, well, are you in a brace? I go, yes, sir. So, well, if you took that brace off, what could we do? I said, well, you could kill me if you took the brace off. Uh, and they said, is there anything you can shoot? And I said, okay, oh God, I hate this. Do you have a high backed chair? And they go, yeah. So I said, I could sit in a high back chair with my neck brace on. You roll the camera. I'll take my brace off and toss it to you with my head being supported by the back of the chair because I have a broken neck, if you guys understand this. And then Kristen Bell, who played my daughter, could come in, do her monologue. Then you throw me my brace. I'll put it back on and get out of the chair. Well, we were going to try that. So I sit in the chair take the brace off. Kristen comes in, but she understood I had a broken neck, understood the game plan. But I think it was somebody in this room says, we all have a plan until we get punched in the face. Mike Tyson? Yeah. <laughs> we all have our plans. I was on a chair that was kind of not stable. And when Kristen knelt down and grabbed the arm of my chair, it shook and it made my neck my head wobbled and she shrieked and began to cry and she did her monologue and they go cut print perfect and in heroes that is the take they used with me with a broken neck uh after siler ate my brains even though they said he didn't he did and kristen bell crying because she thinks she just murdered me and uh so in television that was a false conclusion because I was a character that was just insinuated into the story. So for the purpose of me dying on Sweeps Week. That's interesting because I think television is in this interesting transformation now with the rise of Netflix and Amazon. There's so many TV shows and seasons don't really, se series don't really go for five seasons anymore. They sort of go for like two seasons, enough to kind of get that demographic into Netflix's subscription base, and then they don't need the show run anymore. There's no syndication anymore. So, I mean, there is a little bit on iTunes, but that's that's it. So the, the structure of TV has changed, even since Heroes. Heroes needed a bunch of seasons, and then they sort of drifted off, and then there was the second reincarnation of it. But it's interesting how important the, the sweeps week is the week, the advertisers kind of bid for time, um, that you, you have to create these artificial you know, scenarios to drive up ratings. Uh, right now I'm working on Netflix uh, one day at a time with Norman Lear. And Norman, who's 95 now and brilliant and still with it. And not a bad podcaster, actually. Not a bad <laughs> podcaster. And we were discussing at the difference between this one day at a time and the last one day at a time. And Norman was talking about the very subject you were talking about is the mechanics of Netflix now and, and of other you know, Hulu, Amazon, is that a show will drop, right? At a certain date, you you get all 12 shows or 13 right. shows, and they all, you could stream them all. So now the writers, instead of writing each show individually to where you have a situation comedy, one discrete situation per episode, now you begin to have a drama for television, a continual novel. Uh, with all 13 shows being one large story. So the writers have a different task in that they're writing a complete arc for the season. It's like they're watching a 13-hour movie. Well, a six-and-a-half-hour movie. Yeah. And Norman said there's another difference, too, is that it removes the event, he said, which was so important in classic television like All in the Family and One Day at a Time, that it was always an event that surrounded, oh, this is the night, this is like with Seinfeld, it's Thursday night or whatever, this is when we right. watch Seinfeld. And people would go, and that is why on Silicon Valley, HBO does not use the Netflix uh, formula of dropping a show. It is one night a week. So that is the night you watch Silicon Valley. 
Sunday night. It creates the event and and it creates anticipation and it creates water cooler talk afterwards. And Norman said, this is an important part of, of the art of television is creating the event out of nothing and having people talk about it for the entire next week. And you don't have that anymore. And in its place, you have the novel, the television novel, which has its benefits in a way. Right. It, right. There's no, it's different. I think it's unclear yet what what drives the art form. Yes. Because I think with the way Netflix doing it, um, I mean, you've been seeing this since the uh, past decade anyway, but there's a lot more complex arcs in stories because you don't need, you don't forget things during the week. I mean, in Seinfeld days or even one day at a time, uh, an episode would be a complete story w without as much of the arc because people would forget you don't need the arc as much. Now Netflix needs an arc for every season that they put up there. Yes, and and if if you want to point to on the map where everything changed, I think it was with Seinfeld hmm. because the TV comedies beforehand were usually five acts or four acts. You know, you had four or five main scenes. With Seinfeld, you would have 40 scenes. And... Rather than a show be held together by a plot, it was usually held together by a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Like there was a jacket that they wanted, or uh, someone with a cape was walking down the street. Or, you know, it was this coincidence that kind of held all these random events together, which becomes a worldview. That's saying that our life is a series of coincidences that uh, we can choose to see a pattern in or not. You know, it's it's interesting because, and this is this is related to Silicon Valley, just because of Alec the the through line of Alec Berg through all of this. But Seinfeld <laughs> was the first show. Larry David didn't want any of the main characters bored ever, so he made sure that every it, most people don't know this. It was just out of Larry David's fear of having a main actor bored, but he made made sure there was a storyline for every actor, and that the coincidence would bind them all together at the end. But that created magic. Yeah. And um, and again, to your point of what Harold Ramis said about Groundhog Day, the Sci Jerry Seinfeld was the world, and everybody else was the world askew, and that that's his style of observational humor. He never really had anything wrong happen, but everybody else was crazy. So yes. it's a perfect yeah. example. Yeah. yeah, Jerry was the world, and he's a very good world, and and he speaks our he is our defender. As we watch through Jerry, he makes very. Uh, funny comments about everything that's going around him, and and we love him for that. And I think I think in Silicon Valley, it's like to your point. There's no one person who represents the world because um, you know Thomas Middleditch, who plays Richard Hendricks. Sometimes he's off too; he's askew as well. But then it might be someone like you know Martin Starr, who's uh, uh, playing. Um, I forgot the, the name of the character, but he he'll often be the one who points out, you know, something weird's happening or TJ Miller might point it out or you never pointed it out. I think you were always the world. <laughs> I think you were always the world askew on Silicon Valley. Just like on 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 Groundhog Day you were the world askew and and I'm sure on a lot of shows you I were. had a few moments in which I was the world at the very beginning. No, but you're totally right. But but what makes those actors so great on Silicon Valley is they know when when the switch is on. They know what their role is. The one time I think I was the world on Silicon Valley was kind of my introduction to Richard. But when you convinced him that you would be a good choice. Uh, or saying, I'm not going to do this without you running the tech. I'm not going to do Pied Piper without you running the tech. Not worth it to me. Um, I'm done. Right. And I quit immediately saying, thank you. You know, we won't do it. I won't do it. I don't need this. And the audience for a moment felt that finally uh, Richard Hendricks had a protector someone who was going to be on his side, who believed in his genius, and was going to protect his invention, as opposed to a different kind of, a different kind of uh, scary theme. Which your character really was, ultimately, was the scary side. Uh, which I think, but I think persuasion in Silicon Valley, a, a lot of money is made in Silicon Valley over like the kind of persuasion techniques that, that you and others were using in the, in the show. The, the clever thing about the way Jack Barker's written on Silicon Valley is, uh, and I was talking to Alec about this, is that I'm a shapeshifter, is that I don't really lie. I don't lie mm. to anyone, I don't think. It's just that the truth I tell is not exactly the, 
the truth that they think I'm telling them. Like when I tell Richard, you'll have complete rights to your, to your invention. Yes, but what he doesn't know is in seven years, he'll have complete rights to the invention. So always and in life, people who lie by using little bits of the DNA of truth, those are the most vicious lies of all. Okay, so now we're gonna get into your book. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> My Adventures with God. Because just even in this conversation, like the cloak of viciousness, like you use all the, like where do you, like, you know, you know the lie with like little elements of the DNA of truth. I'm not even saying exactly how you said it, but you also say in the book, this one line, which really struck me, um, the, when you tell a lie, it's like tampering with time. Yes. So, so A, who the hell thinks like that? <laughs> And B, let's just start at the at ground level and then we'll get into the more of the topics of why you wrote the book and what the book's about. But like, what does, I had a hard, I had to really sit there and think, I had to think of real situations in my life as opposed to just reading the story and or not the story, but you know, your story and, and saying, oh, that's a nice line. I had to really stop and think, what does that mean in my own life? I had to really plug in the, the holes there. So, so lying is like tampering with time what does that mean yes the the purpose of a lie is to control time for example and i think the example i use in the book is for example when you tell your your loved one you're in a relationship that you have a business meeting when actually you are meeting someone else were you at my date last night oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm i was just at kidding. the next table i heard it all uh, <laughs> That, that what you are doing is you are trying to create a situation for the, the other, for your partner, that things are going fine, when actually you are embarking on a new journey to see if you wanna live a different kind of life with a different kind of person, a different kind of partner, but you don't want them to know. So, so artificially, you have skewed the potential time of your, the, 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 the potential time of your relationship in order to explore something else. Yes. Like if you had just been completely honest without the lie, then then the relationship could take its course and time the, the time of it would be different. Someone could say, okay, well, let's just see how this plays out or someone could say it's over right now. Well, like at your dinner last night, you know, <laughs> you know, she's gonna hit you with a plate of pasta. If, if you tell- I'm, I'm gluten-free. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. <laughs> So you pay extra for that pasta. <laughs> so you, you know you 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 tell them this so they stay the same. They continue uh, doing all the chores around the house. They continue checking the bills. They continue doing all the things that they would in a relationship where they don't realize that you are changing who you are without them knowing it. So you are freezing their time. You are freezing what they do while you embark on a new exploration without them. So you are borrowing time in the future for yourself and you are freezing them in the past in doing so. That's what a lie does. So, so it's such a smart way to, to think about it. Like, like, and it's, it's very much related to the word no. So when you say no to somebody, uh, you know, you can say no and give a reason, or you can say no and not give a reason. But often people say no and give a lying reason, like no, my uh, kid just had an accident, and I gotta go to the hospital, <laughs> and this whole thing. <laughs> you can see I've like worked on lots of these. So, so like, how do you say no to somebody? Yeah, I, I have learned by writing this book. I've learned by writing this book that whenever possible, try to say the truth, but. Say the truth without the, uh, and this is something that I've gone back and forth with my brilliant editor, Ben, over at Simon & Schuster, that one of the things I try not to do in the book is put the motive in someone else's mind. Like, I don't know what your motive was at dinner last night. I was kidding about the dinner. Okay, <laughs> so, well, I wasn't. I was at the next table. I saw it all. So, but it, it's, it's difficult when you put, I try not, even for the villains in my life, I try not to put the motive, I have no idea why they did what they did in relationship to me. I could say that they were being vindictive. I could say they were being spiteful, but maybe they weren't. Maybe they just were not conscious of what they were doing or what their effects on me would be. So I think in saying no to people, you, you just explain your end of it. 
I don't think this is going to work. Uh, like, for example, once I had to fire a babysitter uh, because she was having screaming arguments with her boyfriend on the phone. And so I did want to say, I want to fire you because I think you're crazy and I think, <laughs> you know, I'm in fear of our lives. Uh, what I said is, I'm going to have to get another babysitter because I understand you're, I see you're going through a lot of problems here and I can't allow this level of violence that's happening over the phone to come into our house because it scares me. But I wish you well and I hope things go, and all of that was the truth, but I didn't, I didn't insult her personally. I just said, I understand you're going through a hard time now and that hard time cannot be absorbed by the confines of this this home. I, I think by, in some sense then, you can say you're owning the no yourself. You're not outsourcing the no to other people when you don't know, like, like again, like you said, you don't know their motivations, you don't know what the history is, but you're, you're owning it. Like, this is your reason for no right. instead of blaming. And I feel like you've done that a lot with your career. Like, even in the most difficult for people is the beginning of a long career because they don't know how to get started. Do they get chosen by, like, let's take acting. Do they get chosen by the studio system and agents and someone sees them in, in, in a small play in Dallas and, and says, we're going to make you a star, which is, I think, what everybody dreams. Or do you own it and you start performing and you, like you, you created, you know, your beer nights where you would perform. You created lots of situations where you were given, you, you, you sort of diversified your opportunity to succeed. You had, you know, romantic partner who was also succeeding and, and doing her thing. And, uh, uh, I, I feel like you owned you the beginning of your success. Well, I, I, I like what you were saying at the, at the beginning about the fact that we found ways to be creative because there is such an undercurrent of desperation when you're in any form of the arts, especially in Los Angeles, especially trying to be an actor, writer, director, any, any of those fields, you don't know you're at the beginning of a long career. Each, each job is the potential last job of the rest of your life. And you, you have that cloud of desperation over the entire time. I have a story I have to tell you because tell you don't know this story, but you read the book so you will kind of know. In the book, one of those nights of desperation when we sat around the dining room table drinking beer was that I thought, I know, I'll write a song for Willie Nelson because this guy seems really popular right now. He had just done Redheaded Stranger. And, and so I went to the piano and I began writing this song and we recorded it. Uh, my friend had a beautiful voice. We recorded it on a little cassette. And then my girlfriend at the time, Beth, was saying, well, where are you going to send it? And I said, uh, good question. How about to Willie Nelson, Austin, Texas? I mean, he's so popular. I'm sure this happens all the time. It's just like Santa Claus, North Pole. You know, it will right. finally get to Willie Nelson. So the next morning, I paid extra postage to send this cassette of my song to Willie Nelson. And all I was thinking was not that this would get lost, the tape would get lost, but what a great story it would make on The Tonight Show when I finally was a hit songwriter. And I used to go to parties back then and saying, and they would say, well, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm, I'm a songwriter and I don't know if I should say this, but you know, I just wrote a song for Willie Nelson, <laughs> just sent it to him in Austin. And so we're just waiting on that right now. And that's how I would survive my desperation. So my book came out. Uh, my Adventures with God. On Twitter, on Twitter, I get a tweet from a young man from Rio de Janeiro who was a child when I was doing a film there, and he was on the set of Bossa Nova. Uh, his dad was the director, and he, he was on the set, and he tweeted me, and he said, I read your book, My Adventures with God. Do you still have that song for Willie Nelson? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I re-recorded it with some of the members of the old band a couple of years ago, and I have the sound file. He said, send it to me because I'm standing next to him right now. I said, you are kidding. He said, no, no, I'm producing a movie with him. 
Send, send me the song for Willie Nelson, and he'll listen to it this afternoon. And it's one of those magical, and, and, and he says, and then he listened to it, he says, this song is great. I think it's right up Willie's out, uh, you know, right up his alley. Let's see if he does it on his next album. So this song that I wrote for Willie Nelson 40 years ago, because of my book, My Adventures with God, there, there appeared to be no apparent connection between these two events, except they were acts of creativity in the void. Acts they, of creativity in the void. And they made a connection. They made a connection. And now Willie Nelson heard the song that I sent to Willie Nelson, Austin, Texas. And what, what's, what's so interesting is, A, I mean, there's this whole thing about, there's this phrase, think, do. So a lot of people think, like, oh, wouldn't this be great to write a song about Willie Nelson? 99 people will think that. One person will will do it. And so then let's make the song. Let's put it in an envelope. Let's put extra postage on it. Oh, nothing happened. But then 40 years later, you saw a seed grow up into a tree, and now he's he's done it. And now I'm sure there's many things that you did a think do on that nothing happened, but that's how... I think people fail to realize, not, and it fails a strong word, but I think people see that one straight line that you're supposed to do, but that's never the, the key to success. Never, never. What you said, what you said, write it on tablets of gold and hang it in every home. That is exactly true. I teach an acting class when I have time in Los Angeles. And I said, the one lesson I want to give you, the one thing I want you to put in your mind, do it do it. The number of people who say they're going to do something and think about it and, well, I'm going to write a story. I'm going to write a screenplay. I'm going to write, just do it. Now, you you put the number 99%. I, I, in my class, I gave it 95%. I said 95% of the people who say they're going to do something, don't do it. If you do it, you're already in the top 5%. If you do it, you've already eliminated so much of your competition. So I tell people, just do it. Whatever it is, do it. Uh, and there's another thing in, in the book, too, that it reminds me of. Uh, the last section of the book, uh, the words that become things, devarim. The Hebrew word devarim means words, but it also means things. But as with Hebrew, there's always an unintentional poetry of words becoming things. When we speak something, it's different than when we think, which is why in the Talmud, they have uh, a kind of advice to, <laughs> advice to the users of this prayer book to say your prayers out loud and not just think them. Whereas a silent prayer is contemplative and good for meditation, a spoken prayer has the ability to become deed and action. And so say it out loud. And I find myself trying to do that during the day with everything I do acting wise. I, I try, I know so many actors who will go on an audition and go like, well, you know, they're not going to cast me. I mean, there's so many other people better than me. And, and, and when I go in on an audition, I know there's so many people better than me. But what I say is, you know, they may not be auditioning today. Maybe today, the best they're going to see is me. And I don't undercut myself with my words becoming things, things that destroy me. And so let's, let's, let's break that out for a second into kind of the science of affirmations, which has been, you know, popularized by a lot of new age movements, but, but also there's some science about it now. There's kind of a way to propose to say affirmations that are positive and there are some ways to say it negative. If, if you constantly say, I'm the most beautiful person in the world and you're clearly not, it could end up causing depression or something. And, and, and there's science that sort of shows, um, I value kindness over making money, then you'll know, then that's a, a, a type of affirmation that will help you actually determine direction, you know, actions to take instead of just hoping for magical things to happen in your life. And so where, where, how does that fit in? Because I feel it does. I feel there's a, a connection. Where, where does that fit into that dichotomy of affirmations? I, I think 
there's a magical reality that's always working and what is your motive is your a lot of times we we don't examine what our motives are we just do things that feel right and especially when i was young if i were to look back now and the things that felt right were born of ambition not born of anything true or real or good or kind or nice but 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 what's so ambition's important for a young person. That's yes. how you become yes. successful. So, so what is what is more true and real? Well, well, what you were saying, I am a most beautiful person there is, is a statement that is born of not of truth, not of objective analysis, but is born of wishful thinking of ana- of something that you know is going to vanish. I mean, I used to have hair. I used to look like you. you I know? saw some pictures in the book. You're, I, you. You were a star actor there. You could have been. <laughs> I could have been a contender. You could have been a contender. I, I hate to put it that way. You're like the most famous character actor in the world. But I hate that phrase, character actor, because it usually means let's find everybody who doesn't look like Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and call them character actors. Yeah. Like I feel like that's the definition of character actor. The, the uh, New York Times asked me to write a piece on character acting, and the kind of revelation I had working on that piece was if you were a main actor in a show, you have a name. You have two names, like Captain Jack Sparrow or Richard Kimball. You have two names because the writer thought about you a lot. If you're a character actor, you usually have one name. So if you're in a comedy, you usually get a job description and your first name. So I've been Sheriff Charlie. I've been Ringmaster Bob. And so you know you're in a comedy. If you're in a drama, you you get your job description and your last name detective johnson mm. uh principal williams so so this is this is the way it goes and then it goes lower than that when you don't have a name as an actor they usually describe what you do like i've played homeless man 2 homeless man 2 that's when they give you a thing and a number and for young actors out there there's something you should know the role of homeless man 2 is so much better than the role of Homeless Man 1. Why is that? Why would that be, James? I don't know. Per our discussion. Because oh, homeless, you can kill Homeless Man 2. <laughs> yeah, you can kill it, man. Because Homeless Man 1 has to be the world. He has to be your standard Homeless Man. But Homeless Man 2 is the guy who's a little freaky as a Homeless Man. He's the guy who's kind of funny and commenting on being a Homeless Man He's he's the Ned Ryerson of homeless people. Right. So so it's funny because in that scene with Ned Ryerson, you let's say if you break down that scene, you're doing probably eighty percent of the talking, and Bill Murray is more just kind of wondering. You could see him wondering in his brain what's happening. So he's just <laughs> you're watching him observing, and we feel like we relate to him, but you're actually have all the lines in the scene and and responsible for for the rhythm of the scene, and and responsible for that and. So much of it plays off of Bill. It, it, what makes the scene work is Bill. And another thing that's remarkable in terms of what we were talking about at the beginning, in terms of Aristotle, when you're doing a movie, you do have three acts, like in a play, act one, act two, act three. Before Bill runs into Ned Ryerson, he is the antagonist of the movie. Mm. Once I show up and Bill is on the street, Bill becomes a victim and he becomes the protagonist of the movie from that point on. So the meeting with Ned Ryerson on the street is the switch that happens that turns Bill from being the snide, you know, the guy we don't love to the guy we do begin to love. Our relationship with loving him begins. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're only at the beginning of going over your book. <laughs> Trust me, we're, you're in good hands. We're gonna we're gonna discuss the the book, My Adventures with God. It's an excellent book. It blew me away. But important question: what what makes you so annoying in all these movies and shows? <laughs> like you ju- you changed Bill Murray from the bad guy to the good guy in one of the most seminal movies of all time because you're annoying in that movie. like, And they cast you for that. And you do the same thing in Silicon Valley. Like, you know, we don't know where, you know, we don't know where you are, where Richard Hendricks is. You know, you're, you know, and when you, you're all over the place turning people from bad to good. 
Uh, now this is now per what we've been discussing. So one of the things you do as an actor is you don't play annoying. Annoying doesn't exist. Huh. Annoying because nobody a- wants to be annoying legitimately. No, no one's going to say I'm an annoying person. I'm going to play annoying. Yeah. That doesn't, yeah, yeah, annoying is in the eyes of the beholder, and hopefully it's amusing annoying. What I had one great acting teacher, Ed K. Martin, who said, all characters are based on two questions. What is your greatest hope and what is your greatest fear? And between those two points is a tightrope where all other questions are can be answered. So a lot of times in Los Angeles and Hollywood, and that's the sort of place, you don't have a lot of time to work on a part, but you do have time to answer those two questions. You may not be able to fill in everything, but if you know what your greatest hope is and what your greatest fear is, like Ned Ryerson, my greatest hope was to be liked and to be liked and and by people that I admired in high school, like Phil Connors. You know, I want to befriend him. I want him to be my friend. And so that is a great hope. And my greatest fear is that I'll be an outcast and shunned and left alone. And between that, there's a poignance that, that there is a poignance that comes to Ned and a humanity that comes to him, even though the character is way over the top. I remember I, I asked Harold Ramis when we started shooting first. That was the first... The scene with Bill and I was the first scene shot in Groundhog Day the first day. Oh, really? First scene, first day, and I was so scared. I was so scared, and we did our first scene in the street, and I said to Harold Ramis, I said, am I too broad? I feel like I would be playing in the Roman Colosseum. And he goes, Stephen, no, 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 no. You, you see, you are the spice in the stew. Bill is the stew. Bill has to play it straight because he's the stew. He's the world. But you are the spice in the stew. You could do whatever you want. Right, because the you're the you're framing the scene. You're the whole frame of the scene. the the world The world is 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 suddenly turned upside down because of what you're saying. Exactly. And and there's another side story that's kind of interesting that crosses from the acting world to the real world. So I was scared to death doing Groundhog Day. It was a huge movie for me. It was a huge part for me. I'm shooting the first day at dawn on no sleep. I'm terrified. I come out and there are about 500 town people watching us doing the scene. And there is a face in the crowd I recognize, David Nichols. I had seen David Nichols four times in my life. The third time, this was the fourth, the third time I saw David Nichols was when I was doing uh, Great Balls of Fire and I got married to Anne. And he was, he was the, uh, art, one of the art directors on Great Balls of Fire and I ran into him at the hotel on the day I got married to my wife. Uh, the time before I saw David Nichols, it was my first day in Los Angeles. And I had a number from his brother, Chris, and said, call David up, maybe he could help you. Because David was working in films he happened to be working on the film New York, New York. My first day in LA, I called David up. He says, well, come have lunch with me. The first day in Los Angeles, I had lunch with David Nichols, Robert De Niro, Liza Minnelli, and Martin Scorsese. My first day in Los Angeles. The first time I met, <clears throat> the first time I met David Nichols, I was 15 years old. I was in high school doing my first comedy And our teacher, Mary Curtis, brought David Nichols, who was a big star in Dallas, Texas at the time, to direct our play. And David Nichols was the guy who taught me comedy technique in Moliere's Miser. I was playing Arpagam, the 70-year-old miser at the age of 15. Uh, David Nichols is the guy who was teaching me comedy technique, first person who ever taught me how to play comedy. So here we are, fourth time I see David Nichols, scared to death. There's a crowd of people I don't know. There's Bill Murray waiting for me. And I look and there is David Nichols. And he gives me two Mm -hmm. thumbs up and a nod and a wink. And I felt like I'm safe. It's my fourth time to see David. So so, so there is, and and this kind of runs through the themes of your book, like, like there, you mentioned it, and I wanna ask about it in, in a little bit, 
but you mentioned how we always look at things in terms of you know the three dimensions of of our life and then the fourth dimension of time but you mentioned very important perhaps the most important of all is this fifth dimension of narrative so sometimes we don't always understand uh in the three dimensions how to connect the dots oh here's david here's david here's david here's this object in time and space but there's a narrative of these times you meet david nichols and that narrative creates the story you just told which of these incredibly important events in your life your school play your marriage new york new york uh groundhog day so so a narrative is created which you could kind of hang your hat on a little bit like you could say oh this narrative means something it's a story that i can learn from or or derive meaning from the coincidence or something yeah we're always trying to no matter what people really say what defines their lives is the narrative they choose to see what kind of story am I in? And am, am I in a love story? Am I in a story of revenge? Am am I the lovable loser? Am I am I the hero's journey? What is the narrative I'm trying to say with my life? And in a way, a lot of it is temperament. A lot of it is choice. Where we go, wait a minute. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to lie down here. I'm not going to be the loser and let them walk over me here. And that creates our narrative too. I think. But, oh yes. But but with, with with the narrative, like let's take the the David Nichols story first. What did you learn from him in comedy class? Like what stands out uh, in 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 your play when he was directing? This is your fifth. You were fifteen. I don't know how how that was a long time ago. Uh, it was, I'll, I'll tell you, it was fifty one years ago. Um, what did you learn from him that you remember right now? He he taught me comedy is clarity. Hmm, to, to explain that uh, to where you don't want to. Even though you want to go quickly, you don't want to mess up the ideas. You don't want to overlap the ideas. It is funnier if it's clearer. Uh, he says comedy is breath. So allow yourself to hear what happens and then respond. Don't run through a response. So hear, listen and speak. Be clear and don't muddy what you're saying with your motion, which is very uh, similar to... Um, with those, uh, I'll, I'll remember their names later. Uh, Lunt, Lunt and Fontan. Uh, Lunt was saying, when you're doing comedy, don't put, don't drop your pennies in the mud. And that was basically what David Nichols was saying to me: make your ideas shine like diamonds, make them clear. Don't muddy them with excess movement. Don't muddy them with excess uh, activity. This is kind of something I learned doing Groundhog Day. When when you have a good line, if you're act if you have a good line, just say it. Just say it. Like on Silicon Valley, I get funny lines all the time. Just say it. If you say a line with an odd expression, like out for that first step, it's a doozy. What people will hear is not what I say, but the in inflection of my voice. An odd inflection will take precedence over meaning. And if you move, it will usurp everything you say, and people will only see movement. So if you if you have a good line, grow roots and say it. And if you think you're going to be funny by putting curly, verbal curlicues on what you say, you're going to be destroying the content of what you're saying. And yet, let's look at like the purest form, like like stand-up comedy. Often comedians will act out on stage what the comedy is. So they'll do voices, they'll move around. So it, it kind of depends, I guess, a little on the comedy. What is what is the comedy? It depends. I think that's why there's a hierarchy with comedians. I, I think, and, and I'm not a stand-up comedian, so I don't know, but I believe... From what I've heard, prop comedy is kind of lower on the list of yeah. people who pull out the rubber chickens. That kind of stuff is lower on the list. And the people who do funny voices is somewhere else. But the people who do uh, cerebral comedy and just idea comedy, they always seem to be at the top of the list of the, of the people that have the highest respect. I don't know. I'm not a stand-up. I don't think I could do it at all. But... That's kind of, that's what Kumail does. And that's what he does in The Big Sick. You, you, you know, you, you get to see that cerebral comedy at work throughout that entire movie. Well, and with Kumail in his stand-up and in that movie, he's often funniest when he is just saying the line. He's a very dry stand-up 
and it and very idea driven. Yes. And so if he were to start like jumping all over the stage, I think it would ruin. It would the ruin it all. It would mm-hmm. ruin it all. And sometimes people do that because they're insecure and they feel that what they have to say doesn't have enough content, so they have to just squooch it a little bit, give it a little curveball in there to to make it work better. So so okay. So now you have this narrative with. David Nichols, and 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 again, you refer, and it's it's really brilliant. I had to really think about it, and I didn't figure it out, which is what why I want to ask about it. Is you know, narrative is the fifth dimension. It sort of implies that there's a sixth dimension, which is who is writing the narrative. You don't quite <laughs> address that. In you sort of merge that into the fifth dimension, where and I didn't quite under I didn't quite understand for sure if you were saying okay, respect the narrative that's always happening in your life. So there's always a story of what's happening in your life that goes beyond you and I are sitting in this room, but there's a narrative to why we're sitting in this room. But there's also someone kind of writing and cho- or we're all kind of writing and choosing our narratives to some extent. Is that a, a, a different way of looking at it or how do you fit that into context? I, I And again, I your book is like amazing because I didn't understand <laughs> part of it. Not because it was bad, because it ha- I had to like stop and really think because these thoughts were so valuable that I really wanted to know what what they meant. Well, I think on a personal level, I think on a personal level, we all end up developing these narratives. As I said, either it's instinct. I've known people who are very negative their whole life, and they develop these negative narratives. Sometimes it's choice. But as you said, it fits into larger narratives. I think we're, we live in the dark so much of the time that we need metaphors to find our way. And I believe I said at one line in the book that a philosophy is only useful if it helps you to see in the dark. Yeah, you say a couple things <laughs> about the dark. Uh, I can get you that exact line. Hold on a second. Just... Um... I'm going into my Kindle and oh dear, because I have this, the, I have the dark highlighted in a couple of places. Um, I mean, you have, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you have it in a couple of places. But here's one: my theory is that over the course of human history, our fear of the dark has turned into science, art, and I guess creativity. Religion. Might, religion. Oh, oh, religion. Okay, but I would say creativity too. But I would oh, well, say, you say art. So. I would say science. I, I, I say science to measure the darkness, art to show us its beauty, and religion to teach us that it's really light all the time. You just have to be able to believe in the light to see it. So I, I feel that's how we've dealt with our terror of, of the dark through those three things. And I find those three elements become a big part of that narrative, that fifth, and as you imply, sixth dimension. What What is beyond? Yeah, um, because how do you take control of the narrative? And you also mentioned the narrative is already happening with or without us. We kind of like just fit into the, we kind of fit into the narrative in our, you know, maybe we're in season 2000 and <laughs> here's a new character and we fit into the narrative. So, so, but, but you have to, to some extent, can't you can't just surrender to the narrative. You have to control it. Not control is a bad word, but you have to write a little bit of your narrative. And so, how how again? How how can we do that? Someone listening to this, how I want to write my narrative now. How can they take that low steps? Well, I think uh, there's something that you've written that I totally believe in, and that is gratitude is a huge first step, no matter what you do. I mean. Gratitude is where it's at. And if you're able to find what you could be grateful about, I have a story in the book uh, called The Shema about I was going to Canada to work on a TV show and I was asking the rabbi at my synagogue, what could I do that's kind of Jewish well, well, to keep up my Jewish uh, upbringing and, and heritage and my learning at the time I'd just come back to Judaism after a long departure of a couple decades. And he says, we'll take the Shema with you, this prayer. He says, it's a prayer in Judaism about unity uh, that we're supposed to say twice a day, which of course I didn't. I didn't. He says, I want you to begin by saying the Shema twice a day. I go, well, thank you, Rabbi. I goes, wait, 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 I'm not done with you. Then the second week you're in Canada, I want you to add by saying the Shema twice a day and every time you have an unexpected blessing. Every time something happens to you that you 
that's just really good that you didn't expect to say the Shema? And I said, something else? He goes, yes. Then the third week you're gone, I want you to add saying the Shema each time you've avoided a catastrophe. Mm. And that's it. That's all you need. I said, that's all I'll need? He said, yeah, to see how blessed you are. And by the end of the second day, I was saying the Shema morning to night. I skipped it. I lied. I skipped ahead in the Shema schedule. When the plane didn't crash in Canada, I said the Shema. When I got through immigration line quickly, said the Shema. Got to the uh, hotel room and I had a TV with a working remote Shema. They were doing the curling finals, so no Shema there. But I went to eat. Uh, I went to eat uh, dinner in an Italian restaurant and the. Owner of the place recognized me from Mississippi, burning, gave me a free bottle of wine, Shema. Uh, walked to a cigar store. They had Cuban cigars, illegal in the United States, Shema. And I found, <laughs> I found, I get a snowflake in my cup of coffee in the morning, Shema. It, and morning tonight, I realized I am the most blessed person on earth, even though I'm doing this particular movie in Canada that was not particularly good. Still Shema in that I got to meet so many wonderful people doing it. And do you think, do you think by kind of, um, pra- it's almost like practicing awareness of these moments because if you hadn't been told that and kind of been uh, on, on the prowl for when these things come up, you might not have noticed any of these things. It's permission. Hmm. And sometimes it's enough for us to give ourselves permission. But sometimes we need permission from that outer force. And that outer force could be science. It could be art that this has been done before as a work of art, or it could be religion. One thing I've been fascinated with in terms of religion and large ideologies isn't what they give us, what they teach us in following their ideas and doctrines, like the Shema, what what the rabbi gave me, permission, to bite on with with that Shema story, but also where do those religions and big ideas exist uh, when you violate? When when do you when you violate the doctrine? When you turn away from the doctrine? For example, in Judaism, they say one of the greatest uh, harms you could do is injuring is humiliating a person. So more important than telling the truth, we were talking before about how you say a good no, more important in telling a truth is don't humiliate who you're speaking to. A person's uh, sense of self is more important than the truth. Hmm. So in hmm. breaking Judaism that way, you go like, oh, I, another thing about- I didn't know that. Yeah, another thing in Judaism is all rules are off if it comes to saving a life. The most important thing in Judaism is saving a life. And you go like, in the breach, I see that Judaism honors uh, personhood, uh, respectability of a person, and life. And that's when you break the rules. Those things remain as, you know, like the coast of California, the wind and waves wear them down, and the only thing that still stands is the hardest of rock. And I take a look at that in terms of a 6,000-year-old religion. A lot happens in our lives, but when you see the respect of a person and life as being the most important things in the breach, then I go like, that's an important philosophy. That'll help me see in the dark. You know, it's so interesting because, I mean, something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is, particularly in today's world and particularly in a city like New York City, is the is the roles between skeptics and open-mindedness and closed-mindedness. And a lot of times skeptics sort of are very proud of themselves like, oh, I don't believe in anything I can't see. I'm going to be skeptical. But if you think about open-mindedness, what is more open-minded than entertaining the thought than someone split a Red Sea in half, you know, or walked on water in the case of Jesus or reached enlightenment in the case of Buddha. And sometimes that open-mindedness can lead to other parts of satisfaction in your life. So for instance, you, because being open-minded about certain things that other people might be skeptical of, you're able to go to the rabbi and say, 
give me some suggestions for Canada. And he's able to, to give you this idea about gratitude. And that in turn helps you write your narrative. So that changed the narrative of your trip to Canada was by being open-minded about something that very high IQ skeptics are skeptical of. Like there's a chain of events. It, one of the things as an actor and as a person is, is one of the big fears people have is being wrong. And this is what the skeptics use to, as a way, they, don't, they won't believe in anything. That way they can never be wrong, right? Uh, but I was taught by Ed K. Martin, great acting teacher who is no more, my love to him, is that, uh, Stephen, as an actor, don't be afraid to be wrong. Not only don't be afraid to be wrong in making the wrong choice, so in rehearsal, make the choice, don't be afraid of being wrong, make the mistake, you'll learn from the mistake. Like commit to it. Commit to it, mm -hmm. even if it's wrong. Commit to it and you will learn something. What's an example of something wrong in acting? Well, I, I think probably, for me always, the initial wrong thing is playing in emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, especially a lot of young actors, think acting is emotion. And we were talking a little before the show about the difficulty of talking about acting. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is, not everybody's opinion, but my opinion is acting has nothing to do with emotion. Acting has to do with clarity of thought. If you can think through a part clearly, we're all emotional. 24-7, we can't turn it off. That's what we are. If you think clearly, you will be appropriately emotional at the right time if you have your ideas there. If you are going for the emotion, and people at home cannot see, but this room is painted various shades of gray. Uh, <laughs> if you at say, least 49 of them, 49 <laughs> of the shades. <laughs> 49 shades of gray is, is that if you're going to play I'm jealous or I'm angry, you end up like with a wall that's painted gray. You end up with no variation. And the in the human life, in the human narrative, we have a million changes that you can't even track, that you can't even trace. And Ed K. Martin taught me, he says, Stephen, you know you're really playing the part when you're not thinking about what you're playing, when you're not even thinking what you're saying, but you're lost in the eyes of your partner. So that's what I'm curious about. Lost in the eyes of your partner. Again, you have this way of speaking. I have to ask the next, the next question. What does it mean, lost in the eyes of your partner? Uh, Stanislavski, in one of his books, said, all life, and this is another one that'll come, all life on stage comes from the eyes of the other person. And it was his way of saying, be a better listener. Don't go blah, 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 my line, blah, 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 my line, which is what actors always work on when, when you're doing an audition. And you're, the actors walk up and down the hallway and that you see them like emoting and working themselves up going, okay, and then they say this, and then I say this, and they say, and I say this. And before an audition, I try to not do that. And I try to sit and say, let's look and see what I could see in this room. Like there's a guitar and that looks like, is that a Fender bass? It, it kind of looks like a Fender bass. I'm not sure. And a Roland amp. I, Roland was always too cool for me when I was playing rock and roll. And I'm trying to see what I can see. And as an actor, when I get in on an audition, my mechanism is tuned for listening and not for speaking. So my life is in the eyes of the other character, of the other person, and what they say to me and how I respond to me. And I don't know how I'll respond. So are you trying to also, though, you're listening, but you also are trying to create a response in the other person. So for instance, in Silicon Valley, when you had that first meeting with Richard Hendricks, Jack Barker has that meeting, you're trying to create a response from him, which is that he trusts you now. Yeah. So you have to, you, so, you, so you're not, you're not um, trying to do an emotion, but you're trying to provoke a, a, some sort of reaction in the other person. I'm, I'm willing to be wrong and I'm willing to lose. At every time, at every moment in Silicon Valley, uh, and then when I become, well, I don't want to be a spoiler, but when I become like in charge of things, then uh, I have to add to that the cover that what I'm doing is absolutely right, mm. for because my reputation is is based on my rightness, and that becomes 
My greatest hope is that I will always be right all the time. And my greatest fear is that people will see that I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. And it creates a new kind of dynamic of that character. So not, not be afraid to be wrong. But you didn't quite address it, which is that um, sometimes you are wrong. So sometimes you're saying you do play the emotion too much. Oh, it, it, it's a temptation. And it, a lot of times it's written into a script. If, if, you do, if you do like a law and order script or something like that, a lot of times I'll write in, you know, so-and-so comes into the room in tears. You know, uh, who knows? Who knows if they come in the room in tears? Who, who knows what that is? Who cares? Uh, I, I remember I worked with one actor who felt like it was so important to be crying during the scene. They would stare at the lights on the set to like make, you know, make tears come down their face to start to start the scene. And it's like nobody cares about tears because in life no one tries to cry. People try not mm. to cry. Mm. People try to show they are together, and that is what's so powerful. There was. I'd like to watch the Weather Channel to watch, to watch emotional life. There was one man on the Weather Channel that was talking about the tornado that hit his family's home and his grandmother dead, his dog found in a tree dead. Uh, you know, he climbed up the tree to pull the body of his dog. To, and this guy is saying, well, you know, uh, my grandmother, uh, she, she didn't make it. She didn't make it. She was hit. She was hit by some debris and to make my dog, I found my dog, uh, Riley. He was up in the tree. I, I pull him down and uh, I buried him right here. I mean, this, he was a puppy. He was a puppy. I buried him right here, but I found my guitar. My guitar was perfect shape, not a string broken. Found my guitar. I tell you, I'd give up that guitar if I could have my grandmother and Riley back in an instant. Mm. Explain that to me. And, and I'm watching it and this guy, not a tear. He is trying to, he, for those Weather Channel reporters, he wanted to maintain his dignity. He didn't want to cry. But if an actor were to, oh, heaven help us, if an actor, I got to tell you, my granny, my granny, she just gone, gone, gone. I mean, it would have been awful. You know, we, we would be taking a hot bath and slitting our wrists. It would you know, actors will see that and will gravitate toward the emotion of that rather than let's talk about Granny, let's talk about Riley and the tree, let's talk about my guitar and my feelings for each of them and my love for each of them and knowing what had happened and bearing Riley in the yard here where he was a puppy. And, and you see that and you do it and you will be appropriately emotional. And, and, and you, but, the, but there's a value there too, which is he valued having some sort of his definition of dignity in front of the weather reporters in front of the world. Yes, yes. And that is part of his narrative. His narrative- From was, way back. From way back. And, and, was, and it created uh, a story of a man who had lost and a man of dignity. And if you put those two ideas together, you felt he would take dignity and loss and you felt he would survive. Mm. And so it became a positive story of resurrection. It became a positive story of endurance. And so as a viewer of the Weather Channel, I felt enormously heartened and I felt that part of me, I think is something my wife Annie says a lot of times about screaming into a piano, that you yell into a piano and certain strings reverberate back depending upon the tone. If you yell into the string bed of a grand piano, you'll hear music coming back of your voice triggered certain vibrations of certain strings. That's what happens when you see those narratives. You see the narrative on the weather channel, of this man, it creates vibrations within in you of certain sympathetic vibrations that help reinforce who you are. And I, I think I'm going to connect this to your saying, you know, um, science, art, religion can, sh you know, all work together to shed light in the dark. Uh, if, if there's a false emotion, i.e. Uh, it's not quite art, 
then the wrong light is is cast. We're not really getting a true story. We're not really getting a true narrative somehow. And and that's something that can go wrong. And and a lot of times people think science and religion are opposed to each other because you know both are ways to 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 seek to shed light and you know with with, with art often to to kind of explain to the layman how it works. But 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 you know one's based on something we can measure and the other is based on faith. And so how, you in this book reconcile that throughout the book. What's what how do you see the reconciliation work? Well, there well in a way what we were talking about they're two completely different uh I think discipline is the wrong word, but they're two uh complementary tracts. Uh science is the way things work. You know, we we examine the way things work, and religion tells us why it matters. It's like Stephen Hawking is a really smart guy, and I'm sure you know he could tell us a lot about uh, black holes and uh, dwarf stars and things like that. But if he doesn't understand the holiness code of Leviticus about do not curse the deaf or do not put an obstacle but uh, before the blind, you could talk. You know, it really doesn't matter to me. What do you, have, you know, what in terms of the sum total of humanity, uh, it doesn't matter to me about dark holes. Yeah, you know, the black holes, not the dark holes, but the black holes of space and dwarf stars really is only kind of interesting as a sideshow if if you don't understand that other part of humanity too, which would be in the book of Leviticus. Uh so I, I think the two work together, one explaining the world and giving us a, a ruler and a measurement to know what is the space we live in and what is it involved. But the other, uh, religion explains what the invisible interaction between people is that we all know exists. Right, and so, and, and to some extent, what makes one pay attention to religion is not necessarily... Uh, God came down and wrote this book or Buddha had this specific experience. But if something, it's it's almost like a social science test experiment. <laughs> if, so, if if a book or, or a guideline has withstood the test of time for 6,000 years, probably society has been held together to some extent by that, you know, paying attention to that. Like not humiliating the other people in your tribe probably helps to keep the tribe together. Yes, exactly. There, there was a Zen story that I'm reminded of by what you're saying uh, about Basho, Basho, I think I'm pronouncing him right, that that he was a great uh, Zen priest and he was going to retire into the mountains to write the tracks of Zen and Zen stories and what we should do and not do. And he got up there and began writing his volume and there was an enormous flood and he had to quit writing and he had to come down and try to save the people from the flood and he spent a couple of years trying to rebuild the community. He set up shelters for people. Uh, he tried to bring in food for the people. Then he went back to writing his treatises uh, for the library. And there was an enormous fire that wiped out an orphanage. And he had to go and try to put the pieces together of the orphanage. And they said, at the end, uh, Basha will be known more, not for the volumes he was writing, but the volumes he had spent and the time he wasn't writing. And that, I think, is the real lesson of religion, is the do, is the do and not the talk and the think, but the mm. do is, is doing the right thing, and it will make the world better. If, if people, I just take a look at that Ten Commandments, I mean, written, what, 3,000 years ago, they figure, so over 3,000 years ago. Yeah, I guess it's uh, 1500 BC. Is yeah, the something like estimate. that. Something like that. And uh, you, you figure if you were able to do that, if you were able to do those 10 things, it is a template for a working civilization. You know, of course, there aren't the tax laws and all those things that, that make things more difficult. But in there is the template for respect of your fellow man, if not love of your fellow man, certainly respect of your fellow man and that his life matters. Do not covet, you know, his property. Well, do not covet. And you, you, you point out that that's a particularly interesting commandment pretty early on in the book. 
because it's not about what they have, it's about what you want. And that determines a lot of who you are. Yes, it's, you know, they always said that the first 10 commandments are the covenant between God and man. And the second five of the 10 are the covenant between man and man. That's the do not steal, do not murder, all that. But I was saying to my rabbi, I said, well, those covet ones, you know, at the end, I don't see how that has anything to do except with you and yourself. Like, what is your envy level? What is, you know, what do you want from your fellow? It's your ambition. It's your hunger. It's your drive. And if you are content within your own skin, you're less likely to murder. You're less likely to uh, violate your, your honoring your father and your mother and things like that. You're, you're more likely to do the right things if you're okay in your own head and your own skin. And, and a lot of this... Um is really about again helping to create your own narrative. If your if your narrative is going to be like uh, I'm going to think a lot but not do, or I'm not going to pay attention to these things that have guided society for six thousand years. Now, admittedly, there's been branches and ideas and religion that have taken society off track. You can argue, but there's these guidelines that have withstood the test of time, just probably longer than any science measurement has, and. A lot of how you can create your narrative is by paying attention to these things. Is that what, you know, the book is titled My Adventures with God. Is it is that what brought you back to kind of having some sort of faith? Is this understanding that, hey, my my narrative could be better if I, if I, if I pay attention? I think when I was a child, I really enjoyed going to temple, going to synagogue. I really enjoyed learning Bible stories and things like that. But you liked other stories too. You know, you liked Eric Von Damme's, uh, you know, <laughs> encounters with uh, extraterrestrials or whatever. Like you were looking for uh, a narrative to put piece your world together as a child. Right, right. And uh, when I came back to Judaism, I realized that they weren't just telling me stories when I was learning about Abraham and Isaac, that, that there was profound thoughts behind these stories that I didn't know when I was younger, that I didn't understand. And so when I came back to Judaism, I went, maybe it's time I just read. I, I think uh, it is, uh, I, I'm, I have this quote in my head that I'm trying to think of Hillel. It'll come back to me in a moment. But um, it's, do uh, treat your fellow man. Well, I'll, I'll come back to it later. I'll think of it later. You just cut this part out of the show. Don't have this part there. No, uh, no, it, it, mistakes are good. <laughs> that's Being right. wrong is We're good. We're learning from mistakes. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, I'm you know at dinner with with uh, that girl you were with last night. I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing her tonight, and and I'll think of this. Very funny. It, it, could be a bit. It could be a bit. Uh, but I think. One of his, at, at the end of Hillel's comment was, the rest is commentary. Go and study, you know, hmm. do justly to your fellow man. The rest is, com so much of it is commentary. So much of it is just the way we, are. this is something about acting too, is, is that there is process. And it's about writing too. There is process and then there's the result. And a lot of times as an actor, when we play the emotion, a lot of times as a writer, when we use too many adjectives and say, well, surely and suddenly and use all those words, we get process in our work as opposed to just putting the end piece down. And I think the same thing is true with religion, that there is a process that we let get in the way. And the truth of the matter is we, we need to love our, our neighbor as ourself we need to put kindness as one of the chief goals. Uh, and, you know, if we, we do that and respect life and, and understand that everybody has the same dreams and, and hopes and ambitions that we do, we're, we're not special that way, that it makes the world a little bit better. Now, I don't know if I answered your question about religion. No, you did because, again, it's you're, you're saying yes. The process has been, and the trappings of religion have been, you know, f recreated a thousand times over in our history. But there's these this essence 
of understand how do we live a better life for that I think is an answered. For example, when I was a child, we learned the story of Adam and Eve, right? And we learned the story that it's Adam didn't listen to God, he's punished, he and Eve are thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Well, you read Philo of Alexandria, who lived at the time of Jesus, pretty much. He was a philosopher at the time and said, well, this is, the Adam and Eve story is a metaphor, has nothing to do with the garden, has nothing to do with anything. It's over the days of creation, every day, God creates something with more consciousness. Hmm. The first thing he creates are the fishes, and then he creates the birds, which have more conscious, then the beast of the field, and then man, to be the shepherd and husband of them all, to make sure that they're all safe. He says, the story of creation is the story of the creation of consciousness. And it's our job as humans to protect our consciousness and the purity of our consciousness and the quest of our consciousness. And that is where religion comes in handy. So, so yeah, so how do you protect the, the quest of our consciousness. What is the quest of our consciousness? Well, if you used to watch the Wild Wild West. I did not. Yeah, well, all 1960s. those guys wanted to do, all Keenan Wynn ever wanted to do was be king of the Southwest. He, You know, all the bad guys on the Wild Wild West show, all they wanted to do was, like a James Bond movie, you know, they want to be, you know, they want to be king of something. It is that you have to eliminate the idea of, of, stomping out other people and stepping on their heads to to create your own glory. And you have to see that you have glory within you all the time. And it's- But that's hard for people to see. It's hard. It's hard for people to see, but it's available for people to see. It's it's uh, with the Shema thing. You know, when mm -hmm. you see your, it's easy to, to focus one day on your blessings. Just focus on where you were lucky, where you got, hey, I got my bag. When I was in Indianapolis on this damn book tour, I got my bags off first, 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 off the big chute, all the people are waiting there, my bags came off first, I said a Shema. I mean, that doesn't happen every day. And those kind of blessings happen all the time in our life and we go like, oh yeah, but we don't piece it together and we don't get the emotional weight of how lucky and blessed we are. And so it is available to us and it's easy for us to do if we see where we dodged uh, the Grim Reaper. Boy, I've dodged the Grim Reaper about, I'm thinking at least three times that I'm thinking of held hostage at gunpoint. You've been a, held hostage at gunpoint? In a grocery store, uh, got out of it. Uh, and then of course, open heart surgery in 2011. A uh, broken neck in Iceland in 2008. So I've dodged the Grim Reaper a few times. Uh, I remember, uh, and there, there are many times that I came very close <laughs> to falling off the edge of the cliff. And, and I look back and I go, any one of those times could have been the end of me, but it wasn't. And so every day is a Shema. Every day is a blessing. And it, it seems a cliche to say it, but when you realize that we're all living on borrowed time, borrowed from whom and for what purpose, mm -hmm. and the, you answer those two questions and it'll shape your narrative. So we're all living on borrowed time. So who are you, who? who you borrowed it to and that'll shape your narrative and for what purpose and that shapes your narrative too. So there, there's kind of an... Uh, what you're saying through all this, there is a, an implication that a lot of people, t skeptics, are going to not like. But you then directly go into it in the book, which is you have some experiences that one could label as uh, unexplainable. Yes. And so clearly, you believe that there, and 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 many people do, and many people should, and even scientists believe this. There are many things in the universe we have not yet measured and we don't understand and we're never gonna understand in our lifetimes. So, and what Richard Feynman says is, is that a great physicist won the Nobel Prize, all that kind of stuff, is that one of the big problems with being a human is that we deal with our senses and our senses are very weak and very frail and very flawed. And so any instrument we come up with to try to detect what is out there for real in the universe is gonna come back to our senses, which are frail and flawed and weak. So even he is creating, as a great, great scientist, is creating the argument that we, there's a big possibility that we cannot know. And, and science 
is always backtracking and say, well, you know, we were wrong about that before. But we feel comfort in the fact that they're out there still trying to come up with an answer. Uh, we have to be comfortable with the fact that we don't know. And we probably can't know because in our essence, we're flawed. And I don't mean as people and as emotional, but we we live in the dark because of our little senses. And we only know what we know. And we live in our little bubble of the people we know and the experiences we have. And when we experience something outside of our realm, we are in a new act one and we're lost for a bit of time. So, so like uh, you had experience, an experience even as a child where it could be labeled as psychic. So do you think that's something that um, uh, we all kind of have access to, you know, through and, and can, you know, through this science, art, religion, that potentially there's somewhere in there we don't understand and we potentially, if we hit the right keys, we have access to this almost music of what's outside of ourselves. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, so my first thought when I had this psychic experience, which I have no explanation for, and I've used several times in my life to, to great benefit of me and my family, my family and I, uh, anyway, I could either look at it as a narrative that I'm a special guy and I have this and I'm going to go on you know, the Ellen show and, and try to, you know, write a book about this and push it. Or I could say, no, we all, I'm a human, man. We all have this. We all have powers and abilities and uh, sensory apparatus that we don't even know we have. Uh, we, we know how quickly bad news travels much faster than through the newspaper. You know, just in our day-to-day -day life, we're able to tell with the look in someone's eyes that catastrophe is on its way or has already come. And we know, we see and sense things that we have no idea why we see and sense them. So I agree with everything you said with the, with the <laughs> it's been a while since you said it, but the latter idea that we all possess these and if we find that little combination, it's easier for some people to find the combination than others. We have access to knowing what we cannot know. And and I mean, I know we're we're going on. There's this there's just too many things in your book to, to talk <laughs> about. Like first off, your book, you know what your book reminds me of? I don't know if you have this in mind. Um, you ever read Travels by Michael Crichton? No, no, no. Uh, it's a beautiful book because he, he he you know, Michael Crichton, of course, brilliant writer. Has written one of the best-selling authors ever, but he's incredibly smart. He's written everything from you know just hundreds of novels, TV shows, movies. Just everything. great, just yeah. great. And um, but he wrote this nonfiction book, a memoir, travels, and he slips you into it. He's like his first travel is why he decided to go from medicine to writing. Then he just uh, then he's going. He's written a little bit, but he's getting tired of LA. He starts to travel to different countries. But by the end, he's traveling through all sorts of mystical experiences and psychic experiences that he's experimenting with. And he kind of just slips the reader into this to sort of kind of chip away at our skepticism every step of the way. And it was really brilliantly done. And 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 your book reminds me of this because you people know you as this and and as they should, they know you as this great actor. You've been in hundreds of movies, TV shows, and uh but you you kind of have this narrative around it, which is all these different ways of kind of shedding light on the darkness in life has brought you to these different, you know, developments. And I think that's that's very, uh, that's made the book very beautiful. What's also made it beautiful though is all these quotes that I just want to keep asking you about. Let me just ask you about one more. Okay. And, uh, 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 you know, and I, I actually have highlights, but I can only <laughs> find my popular highlights. Um, oh, I thought this one was really good. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, relationships never operate at the level of your greatest strengths. They operate at the level of your greatest weakness. Whoever is unfaithful, whoever is more needy, whoever is late controls the, uh, the nature of the friendship. You can swing with it or not, but you can't count on changing it. I thought that was very powerful thing to say about relationships in general. And I wonder if that's always true, that the, the needy person controls the dynamic. 
Right now, I would say yes. <laughs> I think I think it's always true. It, certainly, it's been true in my life to where to where the person who needed the most you know they're ringing the bell the most and and they and you have to deal with that the most it's always the trouble that the and the person who has the most resilience and the most patience it gets the least attention in a relationship at least through my experience well but on the same time someone can be aware of that and and again control the frame of what's happening whether the dynamic in the relationship they can uh not let it cost their soul mm. you know they cannot lose their soul to uh whatever it is and at a certain point this is this is where uh friendships end and whatever because there's always there's a cost to everything uh, we think that there's not but there's a cost to everything and when a partner or a friend ends up costing you to and it happens very quickly you know you think like oh yeah things are it it could be just one thing, and they say it and they do it, and the balance shifts. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine who was working on a show, friend for years, and I saw them. Uh, I I I like the fact that they always used their friends in their projects, but then I saw that he said that he was going to sh- kind of short change one of a one of a friends working on it like that he had worked on the project for he did a 16 hour day and he's only going to give him credit for an eight hour day he's not going to pay him overtime and he said like well if you can't screw your friends who can you screw and he said it as a joke but he was really doing it It, do not think Mm -hmm. he was really doing it and i went like oh and how far away would i be from being in that position of contributing time and talent to, and it changed the whole dynamic of the relation in an instant, mm. in an instant it happens. And you have no control over that. I don't think you see it coming. Something happens and suddenly, boom, done, gone. Um, I wanna I wanna now really find one of my, like, bear with me a second. I, and then And then, first off, I will say, we're going over all these like amazing quotes just because I had to think about them so much. <laughs> but but I also want to um, address the fact that this is a great collection of stories about your your life, your career, particularly the beginnings of your career. Um, feels like the Kindle on the phone doesn't doesn't find my highlights as well as it finds <laughs> popular highlights. So I have to kind of just just scroll around. So just bear with me a second. Um, Oh, the fifth dimension is narrative. We covered that. Um, um, belief is what gives us the power to see beyond the obvious. In the face of loss or disappointment, belief belief is the source of renewal and endurance, the foundation of the sci- of the science of second chances. So I thought that was very important because even science is not about answers; it's about questions. And so you have to believe that there's things we don't know. And so what do you mean when you're saying belief there? Take uh, the simplest idea, me coming to LA to be an actor, believing I could do it. It gives you the power to see beyond the obvious. I'm not getting auditions. I don't have an agent. I'm losing my hair. I There's no apparent route. What we were talking about, there's no apparent course for me to be successful. What if you were wrong? Yeah. Well, then I'd be wrong. And, but that's an important part of acting. An important part of creativity is being wrong and owning the wrongness. It, you grow through the wrong. Uh, but having belief gave me endurance. It gave me the ability to see beyond the obvious, like they're casting all these people with hair, you know? <laughs> you know, sometime they're going to cast someone with no hair. And and it gives it is the foundation of the science of second chances. It's when you believe in something, whether it's something like being an actor, that you give yourself a second chance after you're fired from a show. You, you have a real blow like that. You're fired from a show and you go like, By, that isn't my narrative. I'm going to continue and I believe. So it gives you that strength to go on. And even on the personal level, if you failed 
your partner, if you failed yourself, belief in something that's outside of yourself, like love, can give you a second chance of believing that our love is more powerful than the mistakes I've made or the way I've let myself down. Belief gives you the ability to see beyond the obvious. And I think belief, just to tie it all together, I think belief allows you to explore, to, to better write that narrative that you're in because that's how you write that narrative. That's how you, that you, after you get fired from a job, the next chapter of the narrative is either you running away from it or you learning from it and moving forward. And look at the skeptics. What do they believe? They believe that probably whatever you believe is wrong. That's what they're basing their belief on. And what do they get for that? What, what what do they put in their pocket at the end of the day? What do they put on to protect themselves from the cold? They got nothing. They got nothing except being contrary. They're saying, well, it's probably wrong. Everything you think is wrong. They don't, they end up not trying. They end up not believing. They end up not having the resilience to, to endure. And so mm. skepticism began in the enlightenment of the people who were against Aristotle. Those were the skeptics. And they began saying, well, you can't prove this. All, all these ideas require a leap of faith. We don't believe, prove it to me. Oh, it's just illusion. Everything you see is really illusion. You can't prove it really exists. My kids, anyone who has teenage kids have dealt with a lot of skepticism. I have two teenage kids, oh, so God, yes. Oh God, you know it. So it, it's, it's hopeless. <laughs> so this is, um, that's what the skeptics get for their their time and their energy is a whole lot of nothing. Well, uh, Stephen Toblowski, I honestly wish I could talk to you all day because <laughs> I have five thousand more things outlined. But but what I also really appreciate is is a very just great storytelling style of all the stories in your book. I've been focused on the quotes just because they've really kind of struck me. But there's so many just great stories about your life, your career, everything, your, you, you know, and how you grew into many of these beliefs. Um, and uh, of course, you're an iconic actor in you, every movie and TV show I've ever watched. You've <laughs> been in. Your, your next one's uh, it's called White Famous. It's coming on Showtime. White Famous. It's on Showtime. It's made by the same people who did Californication. Oh, right. It's a spinoff of Californication. Well, only in that I'm playing the same character on that I played on Californication, Stu Beggs. I don't remember you in Californication. I was Pam Adlon's husband for a while. Ah, yeah, yeah. You were a rich guy, husband. Rich, well, totally hung. remember. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I remember, every, time, every time you say that, if, like you start to play, I remember, yeah, you were like a, a major character in Californication. Yeah, it was hilarious. We had so much fun. Pam Adlon is a genius. Genius. Pam Adlon is a genius. And what m people may not know is she's not just a genius actress, but she's one of the greatest voiceover stars we have today oh, I don't know uh, that. she she's won emmys for uh you know king of the hill where she played the little boy you know uh bobby or whatever on on that but also on the set of californication pam has the ability she did a conversation with barbara streisand and the queen of england going back and forth doing it right in front of me doing but, and making it up in the moment, I go, how do you do that? She goes, ah, it's just something I could do. She's brilliant. She's one of the most brilliant comedians and talents I've ever encountered. And she's just amazing to work with. That's great. Well, so you're, so you're in White Famous and you're in Silicon Valley. When's the next season coming out? I have to know. In Silicon Valley, I think it comes out in late May or June. A One Day at a Time with Netflix. That's an awesome show. If you haven't seen that, that is just a beautiful, beautiful rebooting of Norman Lear's series. Uh, I, I play Principal Ball. I'm violating my rule because it's a comedy, but it's my title and on, on the Goldbergs. Uh, I'm Principal Ball and the Goldbergs and I'm doing the Tobolowsky Files. I'm writing stories for the next season of the podcast. Oh, great. Well, and My Adventures with God, I highly recommend the book. It's a great book. It'll make you think. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry, all that stuff. Please buy it. It's great. I'm not just saying that because you're out right here, but it's it's really made me think. And thanks so much for for spending so much time. Well, thank you for for having me. I love it. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you. 
For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks so much for listening. It means so much to me because I really love getting to do these podcasts and to talk to all of these incredible people. I learned so much and I hope you learned so much as well. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.